Like, is that going to be a, I, I think he said he's not, that won't be a thing. No, he said yesterday it won't be a thing. No, he said it won't be a thing. All right, uh, Matt, you can uh, spend a minute to write down uh, the assignments that I'll be checking, uh, but I'll also send out reminders every day. Um, with the pages that I'll be checking for homework, and these homework problems will go towards your first quiz grade. But a lot of it, we're just doing it. Um, uh, a lot of it, we can just finish in class as well. So, um, so whatever we don't finish in class, you get, it will be responsible to finish it. Next. Yeah. Um, so, do you get full points by showing them the next day, or all on the next day? Uh, next day. So, I want to see. Uh, this is due on tonight's meeting tomorrow, and then Friday's meeting on Monday, and then Monday and Tuesdays I'll check on Wednesday. Yeah. So I'm, I don't want to check on the day, but of course. So everything other than that, I'll do um, the following. Day. Okay. And all the uh, solution keys are also in your packet as well. So um, you really just, uh, but I do want to, you, know, you guys to spend time working through it and. Um, I basically want you guys to feel comfortable going into two with. Um, I after this first quiz, I have a second packet, and then the second packet as well. Uh, we'll just work through as many problems as we can, and whatever we don't finish with your homework and uh, those classwork and homework problems will also go to your board your quiz group. Okay, uh, so let's go to page eleven. I think we can go through get through page eleven and twelve, and then. Uh, and I'll let you guys uh, work if you have time because you guys work on page 16 and 17, but if not, you'll be those at home. Okay, so page 11 and 12. Uh, I like to start off with this FRQ because uh, I like how this FRQ kind of uh, uh, covers a lot of AB topics that we've seen and kind of meshes it all into one problem. So. Uh, all right, so let's read the problem here. OK, let f and f prime be differentiable functions. So we know that um, f and f prime are uh, smooth curves, we don't have to worry about any sharp turns or any um, poles or asymptotes. Uh, the table gives values of f and its derivative f prime at selected values of x. Uh, let g of x equal to sine 3x minus e to the cosine 2x. Let h of x equal to the integral of j of t. Um, so uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, yeah, so all this is, you know, all different parts will kind of hit uh, the different things uh, that's given to you. Um, uh, so part A says, is there a value of C between one and five such that F double prime of C is equal to negative three fourths? Provide an explanation uh, for your answer. So imagine um, we had all these order pairs at the F prime level. We're basically trying to guarantee a what of F prime? A slope. So if I want to guarantee slope, that's what does that remind us of? Which theorem is that trying to help us? Mean value. mean value theorem. Yeah. So this is basically mean value theorem here. Now this is a variation of mean value theorem because mean value theorem is usually um, setting f prime equal to the slope between the endpoints. But we can just take all that and um, shift it down one level, and we can see if that can work. So we want to see. Um, if this is true, right? Because f double prime of c, if we shift uh, mean value theorem down one level, we can say this. So if the slope between the derivative order pairs is negative three fourths, then I know that there must be somewhere on the f double prime graph where, or sorry, um, there must be a, 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 a point on the F prime graph where 
the second derivative or the slope of the first derivative is equal to negative three fourths. Right. So basically, um, we're taking mean value theorem and just adapting it. So, um, but if we can, let's see if we can get this to be true. Right. Okay, so what's f prime of five? Okay, so put that in. What's f prime of one? What's that equal to? Yeah, so we know that um, because the slope between the f prime graph is negative three fourths there must be a place on the f prime graph where the steepness of that graph is going to be negative three fourths so basically we're just doing mean value theorem but just shifting everything one derivative down so by mean value theorem since f prime is continuous and f prime is differentiable then there must be a point where the slope of that f prime graph is equal to negative three fourths. There, there's a theorem where it's just continuous, no different. That's that's extreme value theorem. Oh. Yeah. But anything that is slope related, um, mean value theorem and rolls, we're going to need that differentiable statement. Okay, part B. Uh, the key is on page 13, so uh, you can always refer to it. And if you're if I'm not putting it up on screen where you want to see it. Okay, everybody good? Okay, right, part B, uh, let the function uh, be defined by k of x equals f of j of x. Write an equation for the tangent line to the graph at of k at x equals 2. So tangent line, that means we just need to find order pair and find slope. But to find slope, I got to find the derivative. To get the, the derivative, what rule do we have to apply here? Okay, good. This is a function within a function. If it was f of x times j of x, then we would do product rule. But this is chain rule. You got j of x inside the f. So let's build the derivative using chain rule. And then we can plug in, find the order pair, and find the slope. So what's outside function's derivative? Yeah, f prime. We keep the inside intact. Times. The inside derivative. What's what's the, the inside? inside? J prime. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, Let's find the slope here. So replace every X with two. All right, so piece by piece, right? We're not going to do all this in one go here. We're going to have to kind of take our time with this. Uh, let me find that J of two first. So this is the J graph. What's J of two equal to? Yeah. 
OK, so uh, all we're left to do is to find F prime of negative one and J prime of two. F prime of negative one, we can pull that from our table. J prime of two, what do you think J prime of two is? Mm -hmm. Three. What's the slope of this line segment? Negative two, negative two, right? Down two over one, slope of negative two. So k prime of two is equal to six. Six. Okay. All right. So see if we can plug two into the original function and get the y value, and then from there build your tangent line equation. Okay. Try that. K of two is just F of J of two. J of two is negative one. F of negative one is four. You have your order pair. You have your slope. Point slope form. Question with part B. OK, let's look at part C. Part C says find uh, the slope of the tangent to the graph of G at X equals pi. So uh, if I want to find the slope of the tan of the tangent at pi, I need, I need to find the derivative. To find the derivative, I have to involve what? Change. Change. Yep. So see if you can go through your derivative process. Sine of u is cosine u times u prime. E to the u is e to the u times u prime. Now, I also included this. Um, this will not be provided on your quiz, but um, these are all a lot of um, really helpful uh, formulas uh, that we've covered um, in class this semester, so we can refer to it. A lot of it is on that back page, page 28. Okay. And then once you find the derivative, you can plug pi into the derivative to get the slope. And then have you guys try that?
OK, so just running through the derivative rules here, sine of u becomes cosine of u times u prime. E to the u becomes e to the u times u prime. And cosine of u's derivative is negative sine of u times u prime. So a lot of this uh, nested chain rule uh, with that second set of terms. And once you get to the derivative, replace every x with pi, and you're just trying to get it all down to a numeric value, get all the trig resolved to be the uh, ratio values, and then see how far you can go in terms of cleaning it up. It's like generally non calculated, right? Uh, Yes, I want to see all your steps, but I will let you use your calc your, your calculator on the quiz. You know, so you can double check your answer, but I do want to see all your steps. Um, but if this work on the AP exam, would this be? Calculated? Yeah, on the AP exam, this is this will be this is because they're not calculated. Okay. No. But at the same time, um, if you have messy numbers on the non-calculator section, you're never expected to have to clean all those terms up. You can leave all your answer unsimplified and you'll get full credit. So. Okay. okay uh, are we okay? A through C. Any questions? OK, part D. Part D says find H of 4 and H prime of 4. So let's look at what H of X looks like. So H of 4, H of 4 is simply replacing the X with 4. You have to right, so here um, I'm, I'm having to read the graph, right? I'm looking at the area between under the, the J graph between four, and, between four and six. But yes, because I'm reading the graph, I prefer to flip the bounds so that I can read it from left to right and don't have to get, interpret above and below as you know, opposite signs. So um, G of T, not J of X. Right, right. But um, when this gets evaluated, it does turn. So we're, we'll treat J of X and J of T as the same. OK. All right, so we have to flip the bounds, but if I flip the bounds, what needs to happen? Negative. Negative. Okay, so four to six, what's the area here? Yeah, so this is three, one half base times height. OK. If I want to find a, find h prime of 4, I first have to find h prime of x. To find h prime of x, what does that remind you of? Second, Second theorem, yeah. Plug the upper bound. Uh, we'll derivative integral cancel each other out. Plug the upper bound into the variable times the upper bounds derivative. So x times one is not going to change anything. So h prime is simply just j of x. And j of four is equal to zero.
Mm -hmm. The first part, what would that be? Oh, units. Mm. They don't give us units for the problem, so we're not to worry about units for the answer. Yeah. Um, All right, first page, everybody OK? All right, second page. Uh, on what interval is H increasing and concave down? So um, we know that we don't have the H graph in front of us, but we do have something related to the H graph. We know that H prime is equal to J of X. So this is basically the what? We're looking at the, the what of H? Derivative, yeah. So this is the derivative graph. So we just do everything that we do from a derivative standpoint. So this is our derivative graph. Let's label. You don't have to label, but I, I find that to be helpful. Let's create our slope sign line. Let's create our concavity sign line. And once we have everything in front of us, we should be able to confirm um, where the H graph is showing both these behaviors. So uh, what goes onto my H prime sign line are the slope zeros are all the critical points, all the X intercepts. So it looks like that's around 1.5 and that's at four. Above the X axis means positive slope. Below the X axis means negative slope. So we start off positive slope, negative slope, positive slope. H double prime, my concavity, my points of inflection, where are the points of inflection located if I'm looking at the derivative graph? Hills. Hills and valleys, right? So one, three, and anywhere there's a positive slope on the F prime graph or H prime graph, that means on the original H of, graph, H of X graph, there's concave what? Positive slope means concave up, negative slope means concave down. Yeah. Okay, so on what interval is the graph increasing and concave down? Good. Yeah, it's a lot easier if you have everything lined up. Yes. Wait, wait so since um, break x is the lower bound, shouldn't it like be the opposite? Do you have to? You have to negate it to get six to be the upper bound because all the values we're looking at are below six. Mm, let's see. I think this tells you the order pairs. But still, the graph is going still going to behave um, like an H prime graph. Well, I just say that because if you're evaluating in a row, like the positive areas there are going to be negative, and the negative areas are going to be positive. Mm -hmm. Let me see. That's true, 
um, in terms of our order pairs, but if we were to sketch out this graph and we were to find all these order pairs, it'll still follow the behavior of the rise and fall of the based off the H prime graph. But um, we're going to find a lot of those order pairs for, from F, so hopefully that will help confirm your questions. OK. OK. Um, all right, so having everything lined up, I think is really helpful um, because we can kind of see, you know, uh, where both behaviors are occurring at the same time. Okay, so the graph of H is increasing and concave down on the intervals from 1 to 1.5 and between 5 and 6. Okay, part E is going to be helpful for our next part here, part F. Find the absolute minimum absolute max value of the H graph on the interval from zero to six. So um, what does that remind you of? Absolute min, absolute max. EVT, right? So if I want to find absolute max, absolute min, I have to consider what? Critical points and yeah. endpoints. Yeah, so all you need is looking at your slope sign line, right? Because these are all the candidates that you're having to involve for your H of X function. So we have relative max, so relative min, and endpoints. So we'll plug these all into the what? Into the H of X. So H of X is going to tell us the Y values at those points, and then we'll compare those Y values. Highest is your absolute max. Lowest is your absolute min. Right? So we'll test one point at a time. You may have to flip the bounds in order to uh, read from left to right. And we also need to make sure that we find all the areas of our triangle so that we can involve them as we find, um, as we total our values. OK, so try that. Try part F. You need to find h of 0, find h of 1.5, find h of 4, and find h of 6. Mm -hmm. like, oh, it's called critical points for the first derivative graph, right? Right. What's it called for the second? Uh, for the second derivative, um, those are um, where your original graph is going to reach maximum and minimum steepness, it's really not going to matter for us, right? So all we care about are um, relative max and relative min to as candidates for highest and lowest points on the original graph. The points of inflection, right? Right, right. So the points of inflection is not going to matter for um, for EBT.
Okay, so following the definition for our h of x function, um, the x, the upper bound, uh, is our variable. So we want to go from 6 to 0, but 6 to 0 um, feels like it's reading backwards. So we'd like to put the bounds, pull a negative outside. So we'll read the graph as is. From 0 to 6, it's 0 0.75 minus 3.75 plus 3. That's equal to 0. So if I put a negative in front of 0, I still get 0. I'll go from 6 to 1.5, which easier um, to work with if I flip the bounds and pull a negative outside. Look at my graph here from 1.5 to 6. I have a negative 3.75. I have positive 3. Change that sign, I get 0.75. Change of 4, the integral from 6 to 4. I flip the bounds again uh, from 4 to 6. I get an area of three, but the negative out in front makes it a negative three. And h of six equals zero, because my bounds are the same. So I start off with order pair zero, zero. I rise up to a order pair 0.75. I fall all the way down to a y value of negative three, and I rise up to zero. And then that behavior in terms of the movement is consistent with what we see here. It rises up to that second point, it falls to that next point, and then rises again to that zero again. So, um, but these are the y values that are the candidates for our highest and lowest points. So by EVT, the absolute max value is 0.75. And the absolute minimum value is negative. Yeah, any questions with part F? OK, part G, uh, evaluate the definite integral from 1 to 3 of F double prime of 2X. We know F double prime is going to rise up to F prime, but we've got to deal with that 2X inside the parentheses. So there's a little bit of what going on here. Use of. Yeah, use of substitution. OK, the reason why is because we do have a rule for this, but we only have a rule for, for it, right? We know the integral from A to B of F double prime of U is going to be F prime of B minus F prime of A. But we have to worry about the 2x inside. So we'll go through our full U substitution steps so we can figure out what leftover we got to worry about. And then we can adapt that um, first theorem to make that F double prime rise up to F prime. And then we can work in the bounds. F double prime becomes F prime. Uh, let me change that U back in terms of X. And then we can work in the original bounds because these are both in terms of X, so there's no mismatch of variable here. Upper bound first. Now we're just relying on our table of values to get to our answer. Oops, sorry, I forgot what. Got the one half. Did 
do the research? Um, you don't have to if you understand that there's a one half that's going to come out of it. I think use substitution is the best way to make sure that you understand what's going to be in front. Can I do this now? Fix them into advisory. Okay, any questions? All right, a few minutes left. Uh, let's see if we can um, start page 16 and uh, see how much you can do. And whatever you don't finish, um, that'll be your homework. So tomorrow I'll check pages 11 and 12, 16, 17. I mean, we should, yeah. Include the classwork as part of your. Uh, homework break. So, all right. So, uh, start page sixteen. Work about five or so minutes, and then we will stop. Key is attached, so you can check your progress. Doesn't mean the uh, sum intervals given in the table. I just uh, where do you where? Oh, um, so the intervals given in the table. So interval of one, interval of two, interval of six, interval of three. Oh, yeah.
this is from the package. Yeah. Expert okay. You also need to show me the, the packet AP problems, though. So, 